Uh, so, uh, if you regarding the suggestion for the today's uh, consultation, I would suggest just to show slides again. Just we will go through, not very slowly, but just to remind us about uh, the presentation. I would just uh, like to tell also Mr. Medan that there is also the re records of the presentations in Slovenian that I uploaded to the classroom. If you are interested in the Slovenian version as well, yes, so, okay, they are they are available uh, also there. But uh, today I will just show this. Uh, chapters. We will just go through the chapters, and after each chapter, we will have uh, discussion and question. If you have any questions already prepared, or maybe just uh, to discuss what uh, might be on your mind regarding the slides that you will see again today. So, if you agree with that, or do you have any other proposal? I think it's fine. I, by the way, I managed to open the document now in another browser, so that is good. Okay, now. <laughs> okay, great. That's that's perfect then. That's perfect. Anyway, I will now show this full English version of the presentation, and uh, we will go not slowly, but let's say just to remind us about uh, the subject and about the issues that might be, and then we will have a discussion. Okay, I will just try to share uh, my presentation with you. Just a second, I need to share it. Okay. And then please confirm if you can see my presentation. Yes, I can. Okay. So, uh, just to remind, uh, we will talk about the freshwater ecology uh, regarding the five main chapters. Uh, the first chapter is going to be about the natural factors acting in fresh waters. Then we will move to anthropogenic factors. It means to the factors that are related to the human activities. Uh, and in this third chapter, we will touch the multiple factors and how to disentangle the effects of those multiple factors, as we need to know that usually not just natural and anthropogenic factors co-react, but also varied um, anthropogenic factors can be active uh, in the environment. Then we will move to the ecological assessment of fresh waters. And at the end, we will look for the, some information about the sustainable management, because we are now in the phase when this is becoming more and more important. So we will start with uh, natural factors. If there will be any questions during the presentation, you can stop me and raise the question. If something is there burning, but in any other case, at the end of each chapter, we will have a discussion when you can raise all of your questions and also thoughts or comments uh, or whatever might be in your mind. So regarding the freshwater ecology, uh, classically we have this abiotic part, which uh, we usually call the biotop, but uh, generally in English speaking, this is more often used as habitat. Uh, and on the other hand, we have uh, assemblages, uh, biostenosis. So we talk about different assemblages, like usually fish, bantico vertebrates, phytobantos, macrophytes. Uh, and these will be also the categories that I will use uh, today. But of course, there are all other uh, groups of organisms that can be found also elsewhere. On the other hand, we have several environmental parameters that act on these uh, assemblages, especially important uh, can be found temperature, oxygen conditions, nutrients in the water, organic matter, pH, substrate, uh, which is one of the most important. And of course, flow, water flow, which is uh, the, one of the key factors acting, especially in running waters. But of course, it is very important also in 
in uh, standing waters like lakes, especially when the stratification is present and so on. So basically, main characteristics, especially of the rivers, as I already mentioned, is the flow of the water that depends on their precipitation, evaporation, as well as runoff. And of course, uh, the habitat that we can find in the river uh, depends a lot uh, on the conditions, as we will see later. Uh, besides the surface flow, there is also the groundwater flow that can interact with the water in the uh, channel and can be also very important in certain types of rivers. Natural flow. Flow is one of the key parameters. Uh, and of course, on the right hand side, you can see uh, a discharge changes due in the time. So it's an annual discharge curve that can be found in one of the Slovenian rivers. And we can see that there are long periods of, let's say, of low flow, and then we have uh, some events of high flow. And of course, these events of high flow are crucial, especially for the functioning of the river system, especially certain actions like dispersal, uh, interchange with floodplains uh, are very important uh, and directly related to these peak flows. On the other hand, we also can find interannual variability. It means that the conditions are not same each year. And this is also very important, especially from the biodiversity point of view, because uh, it can support much more species as we can found in very stable systems, even in stable freshwater systems. And of course, all these changes in the flow that can be recorded and observed during the time are impacting organisms and directly influence the organisms and their presence or even absence. Generally speaking about the community or assemblages, usually we work on the related species as probably in most of also of your cases, rarely we can find even studies where like uh, phytoplankton, phytobentos, fish and uh, macrophytes would be considered together. It means that uh, usually we work only on fish or benthic vertebrates, or it means only on certain taxonomic group, whereas occasionally can be found that people work also on gilts, like species groups with that use same sources, or and, uh, usually we have a combination that we work on certain species that can be found at one place in certain period of time. And we usually talk about assemblage. And today, most of the uh, my presentations will actually deal with assemblages uh, that were studied in relation to the environment. First, and one of the key actions before us in studying uh, aquatic ecosystems is actually sampling of organisms because sampling is a key and very crucial that all the following analysis can be interpreted correctly. Because if you don't do appropriate sampling, then also all other analysis available cannot be uh, understood and cannot be considered as appropriate. Uh, of course, sampling means that you take only some of the organisms from the certain habitat and you try to explain and interpret as something what is true from the natural point of view and usually we deal with distinct taxa or varied abundances and of course we never know whether our sampling was really completely appropriate from the sampling point of view that's the reason that we need to know what the objective of our study because if we know the objective then we can adapt appropriate sampling and usually you can find several sampling protocols uh, that can be used for certain purpose for certain objective and it's very crucial that this sampling is representative 
it means that really what you will sample is really representative for the specific habitat, for specific stretch of the river, for the ridge, whatever you want to uh, study. On the other hand, your sampling needs to be repeatable. So if you can do on the way that you can describe how it was done and that even somebody else or you alone can sample again in the same way, it means that you can repeat the sampling. And of course, what's very crucial, especially for the further steps, especially for the analysis, is that data need to be of the high quality because when we studied uh, varied uh, groups of organisms, especially when data are collected throughout the Europe or larger regions, or were collected by different groups of people, then this variability is usually increasing. And that's one of the reasons that usually in the big studies where plenty of data is uh, merged, usually this data quality is lower. Of course, depends on the sampling, depends on the aim, depends on the objective, you should use your appropriate approach. Usually we use multi-habitat sampling in aquatic ecosystems, especially when we study uh, assemblages, especially assemblages in relation to the environment. This is one of the cases that we developed uh, in Slovenia, how to sample uh, littoral zones in lakes for benthic vertebrates, uh, because we know that substrate and the water depth are among the most important factors acting. And uh, we developed so-called uh, multi-habitat sampling as a combination of depth zones and substrate types that are combined in so-called microhabitat types. And this is usually used in order to get representative assemblage for certain uh, littoral zone in the lake. And of course, it is not meant to sample a whole lake, but just certain sampling stations in the lake and then try to interpret as the situation in the whole lake. Top sampling, this is one of the possibilities, especially when you deal with plenty of organisms. And of course, one of the key issues is how to get the compromise between the cost speed on one hand and of course the result reliability on the other hand. Because especially from the research point of view, you would like to have as reliable result as possible. But of course, when you do the subsampling, it means that part of their reliability might be lost. Of course, it's not necessary. That's the reason that you need to check what's appropriate beforehand. And one of the studies that we have done when we studied varied uh, characteristics of the assemblages, and we found that different subsampling sizes should be used for different characteristics, like functioning of the community, you need slightly less, slightly less uh, big subsample, whereas especially for the diversity metrics and uh, abundance metrics, this number, this portion should be slightly bigger. Anyway, the most crucial is that you are aware what means subsampling and that you can decide appropriately according to your objective uh, and uh, your interpretation of the results that is following. Okay, let's go now to the natural factors. Of course, it has been studied for more than a century, especially lakes, uh, uh, studies in lakes started already a long time ago. Uh, and of course, first uh, descriptions like thermal stratification or lim limnological zones actually were described already the, the beginning of uh, 20th century, uh, whereas in rivers it was studied slightly later. But anyway, already in the 60s, we have had longitudinal zonation uh, and slightly later river continuum concept was developed. And the main difference between the longitudinal zonation and the river continuum concept is that in longitudinal zonation, we are talking about the zones in the river systems like Cranon, Eritron, and Portamon. And of course, there are also several zones within each of the main zones. 
Whereas in the river continuum concept that was developed in the USA, uh, the main idea is that the conditions are changing uh, all the way downstream. So there is no zones in the stream, but when you go like 500 meters, 100 meters, whatever downstream, the conditions are slightly different than the upstream. Of course, there are certain situations when this is not valid, but generally this is accepted as appropriate. Nevertheless, both, both concepts are actually used and we will also talk slightly a little bit lit, about this a bit later, especially the longitudinal zonation concept is used for the typology. And on the, then we have also biogeographical factors like ecoregions from the 60s from Europe. Uh, and, but of course, as I already mentioned uh, the previous uh, presentation, we need to be more precise, especially from the perspective of Slovenia, because some borders were developed very nice at the European scale, whereas some others were very tentative. It means that like in Slovenia, there was a border between the Alps and the Dinaric uh, region as the border that is uh, linking uh, Nova Gorica, Ljubljana and Marbor, which are three bigger cities. Generally, it's quite okay when you look from the European perspective, but when you look more closely at the national level, it's not enough. That was the reason that we actually refined, redelineate these uh, ecoregions and moreover we recognize that there are not only two but four ecoregions in Slovenia. As a combination of ecological characteristics and biogeographical characteristics on the other hand we defined ecological types and ecological types means types of rivers that can be found uh, and where we can find distinct assemblages, aquatic assemblages these are based mostly on uh, benthic vertebrates. Uh, we found that some others, uh, like uh, organisms groups, don't need such detailed delineations because we have 74 river types, which is quite uh, a lot for a small area. But of course, on the other hand, uh, Slovenia is very diverse. And uh, it means that uh, varied types, not just uh, for different regions, but also from small rivers to large rivers, also different varied uh, lowland rivers and so on can be found. And that's the reason that so many types are present. And especially dinaric area is very demanding from this perspective, and especially there are many types. We developed also the fish types for Slovenia. There are slightly less fish types, but anyway, also quite a lot. The main aim, of developing is just to define what are differences, natural differences. These are the types that are not influenced by man, not influenced by human activities. These should be the types that are results only of natural factors. And this is the reason that primarily this uh, subject was put here in the natural factors uh, chapter. Of course, then we want to check whether there are really differences in the, between different uh, groups of rivers. This is the case to test the differences between the ecoregions. And first of all, we just try to test it and found that there are differences. And then we also try to find what's the difference between abiotic difference between ecoregions and First of all, we need to say that biogeographical differences doesn't mean only biogeography, bio but means also ecological differences, especially differences in the temperature, in the slope, it, which is directly related to the current speed, and also some other characteristics like substrate, one of the key features affecting aquatic organisms, and also the flow characteristics, which are related not just to the current speed, but also the characteristics like high water, slow waters, and so on. So we can directly relate uh, biogeography bio with ecological characteristics of systems within each of the group. And that's the reason that much more river types than just uh, types within each region were observed. 
Okay, then we also compared uh, insects. So also we if we look just partial part of the aquatic assemblage, we can find that there are differences between some of the regions. Like uh, in the alpine region, we can find uh, statistical statistically higher number of uh, insects. Taxa, whereas in the Pannonian lowland there is the lowest, whereas other two regions are in between. So we can delineate also the regions based on this information. Okay, and then we come to the point when we would like directly relate abiotic characteristics with biotic characteristics. In this case, we studied the relationship between certain abiotic parameters like slope distance to source and catchment size class. These are parameters that are quite uh, heavily related to the topological parameters, but are on the other hand, quite easily obtainable. So it's not, you can measure, you can measure and get this information from the maps. You don't need to go to the field and measure uh, several demanding parameters. On the other hand, we compared uh, different uh, characteristics of the macrophyte community. Uh, but didn't want to describe their relationship because we were just interested in whether there is, what are the patterns and what's the distribution of sampling sites uh, between these selected parameters. And of course, inspection by eye, you can immediately see that in some cases it's much more evident relationships that could be described even maybe linear. Whereas in some other cases, there are much more scattered data and it's not so easy to describe it. But of course, the key, one of the key aims in ecological studies is try, we just want to describe the relationship between environmental variables and between the biota on the other hand. And of course, when we see such a uh, distribution of uh, samples, usually, we want to ask ourselves, okay, what the best description? And we usually try different, different relationships, like different regression curves, uh, different modeling techniques, whatever. But actually, it is important how we describe. But what's even much more important from my perspective, especially we will talk this later, is what is the causing this relationship so what's behind what's the real action that we can find what is the real impact that is having this environmental variable on the community or on the biota generally so relationship often is not enough although it might looks very well it's not enough because we don't understand because when we understand the relationship then we know what's the cause that actually action acting on this perspective. So keep in mind that also for the later discussion. Okay, then we come to the environmental variables and we have several natural variables that were recognized as important for the biota in aquatic ecosystems. So if you read the literature, you can start from A to Z and you will find plenty of them. But of course, what's the main issue? When you do the statistical analysis, then you need to limit selection of your number of your variables, because we know that chance is one of the factors that we would like to exclude. And more than you make relationships statistically, more relationships that you make or more correlations that you calculate, bigger is the chance that something you will what you will see is due to a chance and you don't want you don't want to have it because you would like to have was the real relationship in the environment that's the reason that you need to make selection of environmental variables that you will study and of course if you know what's your objective and what your level of study then you can easily select parameters if you look to this uh, pictures are taken from Anne at all, you can find that certain parameters like temperature, sediment retention, nutrient retention, so on, so on, are acting and regional scale, like at the catchment level. 
Whereas other parameters like shade, habitat, organic matter inputs are more at the rich system level or even at the local site scale. So the fact is that based on this information, you can much easier select the parameters that might be appropriate according to the aim of your study. And this is one of the case studies that we have made in Slovenia quite recently. Uh, we were just interested to find what habitat characteristics, what the length of the segment that should be considered to describe two different aquatic assemblages. First was fish and the second was benthic vertebrates. We studied large rivers in Slovenia and large rivers in Slovenia are defined as those rivers with a catchment area bigger than 2,500 square kilometers or with a mean annual flow 50 cubic meters per second. And this is also part of the topological parameters used for the topology. And we studied such river, rivers and compared the conditions at 500 meter segment, 1000 meter segment, 2000 meter segment, and the 5000 meter segment, and try to find out whether same factors are acting at all those four levels. And what's the result? Uh, the graphs on the left, it is not meant that you would uh, see them. What's meant is just that you can immediately see that there is a difference. First of all, the difference between the benthic vertebrates on the left and the fish on the right. And the other, that there is the difference between the 500 meters segment on the top and the 5,000 meter segment on the bottom. So the fact is that there is a difference. It means that varied parameters are influential at different segment lengths. Another very important thing is just to compare how it is changing and how it is possible to explain the varied communities along with the increasing segment size. If we just look the figure A, you can see that there is a slight increase in explained variability with increasing segment length for the benthic vertebrates and much bigger increase for fish. It means that for fish, uh, factors that are acting at 5,000 meters segment length are much, much more appropriate to, to describe the fish community than much shorter length. And this is ex uh, usually was expected because fish are quite uh, mobile and especially in the large systems, you can find species that uh, migrate to different places. And this is the reason that they need uh, slightly bigger areas uh, as their habitat in comparison to the much more micro uh, benthic vertebrates, which are much smaller organisms and can be much more related to the local conditions. Okay, and now challenges for the first group of parameters for natural factors. First of all, we say that rivers are very dynamic systems. What's on one hand very important from the uh, biota perspective because uh, it enables many uh, organisms even to be there, especially variability in the flow is crucial for organisms. Then the scale, scale is another challenge, uh, which scale is, the most, is most appropriate to be studied for varied organism groups. And of course, sampling. Sampling is the key information needed for ecological studies. So if you put, if you have bad sampling, bad, bad initial information, bad data, it means that also the results at the end cannot be uh, appropriate, cannot be well interpreted. So garbage in garbage out system is definitely very much uh, relevant also in this case. Oh, so regarding the anthropogenic factors, of course, I'm sure that we, all are very familiar with uh, anthropogenic activities because we are part of them, part of these activities. But of course, some are directly re related to the aquatic ecosystems like habitat alteration or habitat fragmentations. 
whereas some others we might see as not so directly related. But of course, anything what is changed in the catchment area of the river system or lake system or any surface water is, is having a consequences for the aquatic ecosystem. And that's one of the key key understandings that need to be taken into account when we are studying uh, aquatic ecosystems and we will also talk about that later of course in the past mostly pollution was studied like we studied the river system more frequently due to the pollutions uh, due to the pollution because we know that uh, like polluted waters have several consequences for the water use from the human perspectives even today several diseases are directly related to the water quality but of course as i said there are several changes and we will also talk about others catchment area the crucial approach that we need to take into account when we are studying uh, anthropogenic activities so here are provided some uh, examples like the few sources, point sources, water abstraction, hydromorphological alterations, and all these activities in the catchment are actually impacting our sampling site that we are studying or that we just want to assess. Generally, we can have three key pressure groups. P water pollution, that's the group that was studied most, then hydromorphology, and of course, land use and land use is the group uh, that is studying very intensively for last, let's say, 20 years, especially due to the fact that in the past, this information was not so easy available, but we have found that uh, it can have a very good relationship to the aquatic communities and many activities that can be recorded such a way can be directly related. This is the case when we studied Mediterranean rivers in the European Union. Uh, was the key question how to define the pressures? Uh, and we used varied approaches. But of course, when you go to the larger scale, like in this case, the whole Mediterranean in the EU, it's not easy to obtain very detailed information, especially not for hydromorphology. And this was the reason that we used ordinary variables it means we just defined one to four it means one meant it's pretty natural and four is heavily degraded like for channelization bank alteration local habitat alteration even for the riparian vegetation and so on so this is mo not the most appropriate way because usually it's quite subjective on certain part of the assessment but when you have big areas and no detailed information, this is the approach that is usually used. Of course, with pollution, it's usually much easier because there are methods, several methods, how to measure, when to measure, and so on, and several parameters that are uh, measured in each of the country, like uh, especially related to the nutrients and organic pollution. And, and as I already mentioned, land use is becoming more and more popular, especially with the Greenland cover that it's the source information for these changes in the land use. Okay, if you look pollution, it seems it's easy, but the fact is that, first of all, there are several parameters that need to be considered. If you go to the list or to any study where the pollution is considered, it's usually written, okay, we studied only some of the parameters, some of the water quality parameters and several parameters were not studied because it's not possible to get information or due to the variability or other uh, conditions and another key issue is that we usually need to have several measurements during the year and this is the case you know if this curve is showing the actual concentration of the uh, pollutant in the water system we can see that we just take samples at certain period of time. And usually we go at the low water level because otherwise we cannot sample and so on. And we can see that we can easily not include 
the highest concentrations. And at the end, we usually calculate an average value or any percentile, whatever. But anyway, we have only certain amount of data. But honestly, if we would go to the field and sample like weekly, I did this for two years. I went to two sampling sites and sample water weekly independent of the weather and found out that there is a huge difference in the data when you have maybe only monthly data and in comparison with weekly data. But of course we know that even each minute, each second, the conditions are slightly different. And this is one of the issues that even though we have very good as, uh, methods uh, to measure these parameters, it's not so easy to get good data. Of course, nowadays we have several data loggers uh, and plenty of data, but still what's the main issue is then to relate this data to the aquatic communities. Another parameter is the land use. Greenland cover, this was starting in 1990, uh, provided by a European Environment Agency. Uh, it was much easier to get some data and of course, we, if we just look to the situation, Slovenia is still quite green. So it means we have quite plenty of forests, but of course the percentage of intensive agriculture areas as well as urbanization is increasing. And these two parameters are having huge effect on aquatic communities. And with urbanization, it's very much evident that uh, quite low percentages uh, of urbanization in the whole catchment can have huge impact. Like percentage of two or three percent, it means it's quite deteriorated situation in the river system. We use this information in our studies, especially using the information for the whole catchment as well as the sub catchment. So the catchment directly related to the sampling sites where the organisms were sampled. And of course, later we will also look to some of the results. And then the third key group, hydromorphology. Hydromorphology is quite wide term, which is including morphological alteration as well as hydrological alterations. And usually like channelizations and barriers are the most obvious or at least the most evident and very often used. But anyway, there are several combinations of altered parameters in the system. And the question was how to appropriately describe this pressure. And in Slovenia, we developed so-called SIHM method, so Slovenian hydromorphological method, that is based on the river habitat survey developed in the UK, uh, but based on the information that we observed immediately that only habitat quality and habitat modifications are not enough for describing the aquatic communities. We found that especially the barriers impact is huge on aquatic communities and also this part information need to be complemented to the habitat quality and habitat modification. And that's the reason that we define to upgrade the system and develop five so-called hydromorphological indices. And because the habitat quality can be measured different ways, I will just present now uh, the part related to the barriers and the crucial, uh, crucial information that was based on our research. And that's, first of all, it depends the, of the size of the impoundment like big impoundments have bigger downstream influence like in this case we can see that of course the biggest impact is directly below below the impoundment or below the barrier but in the smaller impoundments especially in the same size of the river this effect on the aquatic organisms is much smaller so larger upstream impoundment means bigger downstream impact and of course, downstream of the impoundment is impact smaller in comparison to the upstream. So the fact is that you need to know what's the size of the impoundment in relation to the size of the system, river system. And you need to know what's the distance from your sampling site 
uh, to the barrier. And usually it has to be said that this impoundance can be far away from your sampling sites, but still can have an impact on your aquatic community. Another thing what we have found is that tributaries to the systems are also influencing the aquatic communities. So if you have a tributary with the impoundment, it will increase the impact of the community. Whereas if we have a tributary without the impoundment, the effect will be much smaller. So dilution effect is also important. And so it's not just about the size of the impoundment in relation to the river system, but also about the tributaries. And tributaries conditions can be very crucial. This is one of the cases like we this year we studied the condition in the in the impoundment as the result of the hydroelectric power plant Kursk on the river Sava. And we found that due to the fact that we have several tributaries that are uh, some of them in quite good condition, the fish community is much better performing in comparison to some other river system where there are no tributaries, although we have similar impoundment. So that's the fact. Uh, what was also proven in the fish, although we first observed this with the benthic vertebrates, like one of those, uh, uh, one of such situations in related to the river Drava, uh, where we have a one uh, tributary like River Meja, and especially immediately downstream of the confluence of the river confluence situation is much better than we would expect based on the observed alterations. So the fact is that actually communities acting and reflecting the conditions that are actually present and not about the our perception of the pressure. And that's very important. Uh, okay. I apologize. Uh, yes, may I interfere because this is very interesting for me. Uh, if you go to the yes. previous slide, uh, okay. actually this impact of the impoundments are here we're talking about yes. uh, impacts due to the change in abiotic factors like perhaps chemistry oxygen level or due to the barrier which is stopping the migration or is this all basically taken into this impact of this impoundment on the river i mean what yes okay what? in this case yeah. uh, actually pardon, sorry just uh, yeah, I, i'm sorry you, uh, you can finish it yeah uh, so basically if i understand correctly you basically sample below the impoundment and uh, then you i mean but are you also looking for uh, basically causes of those changes or all those causes which can be biotic, abiotic, uh, I don't know, uh, the uh, the breakage of migration paths and so on. Is this all basically taken into this index and analysis? Yes, in this case, so far we haven't start, uh, studied all the causes because it wouldn't be possible. We were just interested what's the consequence of the barrier uh, at community level uh, in this case in different relations to the to, to the barrier and, and the whole system to the uh, in the confluences and later i will show also some results of these studies uh, but anyway so it's not the question whether it's due to the i don't know decreased oxygen or okay. it's due to the changes in the flow but it can be a combination of everything you know Okay, oxygen in this case is not problematic, but any other factors like nutrients, distribution of the nutrients, uh, like substrate, especially substrate changes, uh, bank reinforcement, and so on and so on, can be also very important. But in, as already said, we also, uh, in the same system, we also make habitat survey. So habitat conditions and habitat modifications. And later I will show you some results what's more important and what's best better explaining assemblages from this perspective okay thank but you. based on your question did we study causes no we didn't okay uh, I, I will ask a few questions later so that i don't interfere the lecture too much okay we can discuss this later of course yes then we come to the situation with five hydromorphological indices. We have three basic indices. So first is habitat quality index, second the habitat modification index, and then we come to the hydrological alteration index. 
but of course we just we were interested to build us the composite pressure indices where we combine different characteristics and we build so-called hard morphological quality and modification index on one hand and on the other hand we just combine the modifications just habitat modification and hydrological alterations in one hydromorphological modification index and of course we just for your information that you know that we have so-called composite pressure gradients and some individual gradients that will be used also later and show some results okay these are no results based on the large rivers and benthic vertebrates when we were testing these indices okay we sampled all river systems or large river are different with different conditions from quite semi-natural to heavily altered and the most interesting thing was that we found that the composite index was best explanatory variable but the same or similar explanatory was also the index that included only the barriers only the barriers and of course it's not just the coding there is a barrier or there is no barrier, but we have a very detailed protocol how to assess it based on the size based on, based on the tributaries based on the uh, based on the uh, conditions in this system and so on and so on so if somebody is interested i can provide also the paper is they are also available on the research gate and also provide all the list of these papers uh, and of course in this case we found that habitat quality and habitat modifications that are quite often used to describe uh, the conditions in the river system and explaining the conditions are not so important in comparison to the composite index and the barrier index uh, and this is especially important that as several even the european standard hydromorphological standard for conditions in river systems as well as in lake systems is based mainly on habitat modifications and uh, because i was also involved in the lake hydromorphology standard that were developed uh, for the in as european standard the main reason that usually only habitat modifications are taken into account is the reason that it's not easy to develop criteria especially with the barriers it's not easy to develop criteria that would be applicable all over the Europe and because you need to have plenty of information especially if you would like to study it in relation to the biology and usually you find that these assessment methods abiotic assessment methods don't have any relationship with biology whereas our main aim was to show this relationship and to use it based on this information to use it for the further index development, ecological assessment, as well as management of the river systems. Okay, this is one of the newer approaches because we know that all data shown before were based on the field data. We just want to do it based on the remote sensing uh, and we just need to know whether the approach that can be used with the remote sensing is similarly applicable in comparison to the field data as we know that certain hydromorphological features cannot be surveyed using the remote sensing but of course on the other hand we found out that some features that are not easily to survey in the field can be surveyed using the remote sensing approach and when we compare this again for the large rivers in slovenia we found that when we use all sites this relationship between the field surveys and remote sensing approach are very comparable you know r square is 0.89 but that there is a difference between the rivers with a complex channel and rivers with a simple channel so right rivers with a complex channel are those braided systems like uh, used to be drava downstream of maribor or sava downstream of kershko and so on and of course, some remnants of this complex channel can be found in the Drava River, those stream of, of Ormos. Uh, but of course, it's also heavily impacted by water abstraction. Anyway, simple channels are much more abundant because most of the systems have simple channels like uh, several Drava between the Pohor and Kuziak and so on, and Sava in the Posovsko, Hribovia and so on. So that's the reason 
uh, that there are differences. And of, of course, when we study this complexity is actually impacting the survey as well as the air square was lower in comparison to the simple channel river systems where almost no differences were observed between the field survey data and remote sensing data. Of course, what one of the biggest advantages to using remote sensing data, we can do the whole survey of the whole river system as the habitat quality and habitat modifications are changing along the river course. And of course, if you do the field survey, it would you would spend a lot of time to do it. And honestly, it's not possible, but in this case, using the remote sensing approach, we were able to do for all large rivers in Slovenia. So remote sensing definitely approach is well, very useful also for the hydrometeorological alterations and assessments related directly to that. Okay, now just check some uh, studies where we studied the impact of these anthropogenic activities on aquatic assemblages. In this case, we compared natural and channelized sampling site, and you can find the differences in the fish abundance. This is the river Chaunica, northeast of Slovenia, where we compared the natural and channelized system. And we can found that we have certain period of time during the year when there is almost no difference in the channelized and natural river stretch, but certain other uh, period of time where this difference is huge. And especially this is the result that certain fish species that are not uh, type specific for this river system can be very abundant, especially in the summer period of time that when there are several uh, young of the air fish specimens. And of course, immediately when the hydrological conditions are changing, then abundance is also decreasing in the system. And of course, the composition is also different. So we can compare certain characteristics like abundance in this case, or community as a whole, as we did in the next slide, where we compared the community composition between the river systems and the impoundments present on these river systems. And we found that, of course, impoundments have a huge effect on the aquatic communities as there was big difference between uh, systems we in this case we did not look more in detail what's the difference in the community composition but we were just interested whether there is a clear distinction between the river sites and the impoundment sites moreover then we compared different river types these are some types from the Pannonian lowland and some large rivers. And we compared the number of taxa between the impounding and non impounding sites, so natural sites. And of course, what we would expect that the number of taxa should be higher in the natural systems. Yes, but not always. It, we were quite surprised that in certain river types, number of taxa was even higher in the altered systems. But of course, what I need to say here is that these impoundments can differ in size, in type, in the objective, why it was built, what the water used behind that. So this might also influence the conditions in the river system. Of course, we also found one type where there was no significant difference in the number of taxa. On the other hand, in the same systems, number of EPT, Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera taxa, these are some of the most sensitive taxa that can be found in the benthic vertebrate assemblages were always higher in natural systems. So this is one of the indicators what is more appropriate to use when we want to test what the effect of human alterations, what the effect of anthropogenic factors. So number of EPT taxa is much more appropriate metric, much more appropriate assemblage characteristic that number of taxa that is very often used, you know, because, you know, in most of the paper, people use number of taxa as one of the typical parameters. This is also partially the consequence of the biodiversity, general biodiversity, and most people think that number of taxa might be uh, 
really appropriate. Of course, in the aquatic ecosystem, this is not always the case. And this is another case when we compare different metrics, so different characteristics like abundance, tax richness, channel winner diversity, and evenness. These are among the most often used characteristics along the same stressor gradient. In this case, we use the cardiomorphological stressor gradient. And what is immediately evident that two of those parameters, like abundance and tax richness, did not react to these hydromorphological changes along the whole gradient. Of course, if we would use just part of the gradient, like if you look between the 6 and 12, for especially for the tax richness, there is an obvious decrease in the number of taxa. But when we have the whole gradient from natural, which is zero, to have a alternate, which is 12, there is no statistical different changes. And the parameter that we use here was sperma, sperma coefficient, uh, coefficient, correlation coefficient. Then we have another two parameters, channel winner and even as, and in both cases, we will observe a decrease. So higher the stressor, higher hydromorphological alteration, lower is the diversity and lower is the evenness of the benthic vertebrate taxa. And then we come to the question, okay, what's the difference between different types of aquatic systems along the pressure gradient? On the left-hand side, we have the case of the phytoplankton in alpine lakes in the Europe. And first of all, we, we can see that we observe different relationship between different types. This L, L3 are deep, large lakes. L, L3 are large lakes where deep, just deep lakes, small deep lakes, and L4 are actually medium deep lakes. And we see that there is smaller difference between the medium deep lakes and deep lakes than the difference between the large deep lakes. And that's the fact that the response of the assemblages, in this case, the phytoplankton depends also on the natural conditions of the system, not just on the anthropogenic factor. So it's not just about what the pressure, what's the level of the pressure, like in this case, total phosphorus concentration, like typical parameter of eutrophication of the lakes, but it's much, it's also important in which lake type you actually observe these changes of the community. Same was observed using another pressure, and this is the hydromorphological pressure in the lakes, again, alpine lakes, and we can see that we have difference in the response, same pressure, but different lake types. So lake types are important when we are observing response of the assemblages, aquatic assemblages. Another difference that can be observed between types is the explained variability, level of the explained variability or R square, which is called coefficient of determination that actually vary among types. So partially this might be the result of uh, differences of the number of the sampling sites, but on the other hand, this is also the result how other factors actually co-influence the assemblages that we actually observe. And we can see that these changes are not so big, like 0.33 and 0.40 on the left-hand side, and on the right hand side 0.70 and 0.78 and the main difference between these two studies was not in the lake types and not just in the organism groups but is partially also the result of the data that were available because on the left hand side we used all available data in Europe on the right hand side are only data from Slovenia. And we can find that actually sampling and sample processing is crucial because we know that levels 
of explained variability should be much higher for the phytoplankton uh, because we know that the relationship with the total phosphorus should be very good, but was not so good due to the huge data set that was actually used and especially data processing that was behind that. And this is very important. Okay, another important question when we are studying relationships. Okay, what pressure gradient actually we use? First of all, it needs to be clear that all pressure gradients that are used are just the approximation of the pressure gradient that's actually present in the nature. Although in this case, we studied different hydromorphological pressure gradients. And of course, okay, correlations were all statistically significant, but were in range between 0.61 and 0.86. It means, it means that it is important what pressure gradient we actually use because the response variable. So the Baata community characteristic was always same. And this is number of taxa. And this is crucial. So all differences that were observed were due to the differences in the used pressure gradient. So more appropriate pressure gradient, better can be relationship. And this is also crucial because when you don't observe the correlation or you don't observe good relationship, it doesn't mean that the relationship doesn't exist. It depends again, what, what type and what kind of data do you actually have? And this is also another key, key information that should be used in studies. Okay, for the end, just an example that actually environmental changes have joint effects. Like pollution is the result of the development. We have hydroelectric power plants. We alter the land use. We urbanize areas. We have more intensive agriculture. What might be a result in the floods or even have pollution have a direct impact on assemblages because we have floods usually build impoundments or other retention structures. And of course, on the other hand, when we add to this climate change that is related, unpredictability that is related, uh, environmental effects like drought, uh, more water abstraction, especially in the Mediterranean area for drinking, for irrigation and so on. So we can expect that all these effects will be even bigger and the changes in community will be in the future even stronger. And this is the starting point also for the further, further chapter that we need to have in mind that although we can test the response to specific anthropogenic activities or to specific pressures, in reality, usually we have combination of all those pressures in the field. Okay. And no challenges for our discussion. So how to select appropriate pressure gradient, how to have the pressure gradient that is length enough, how to deal with the influence of the natural factors, and how to select appropriate assemblage characteristics that can be used to detect this anthropogenic alteration that we are interested in. Okay, now we go to the multiple factors as I already introduced this before. Usually we have several changes in the system uh, and quite often we study them separately, but honestly, usually there is a combination of different pressures present in the river systems. And usually we need to consider them in combination. So what can we actually do? This is one of the studies that we actually compared. First of all, what's important, which natural parameters are important, which anthropogenic parameters are important. And of course, when we make analysis, we found out that actually, first of all, varied natural and anthropogenic factors impact aquatic assemblages and that actually these impacts differ. Also between the ecoregions, we use same parameters in same ecoregions and they actually differ. So it is important. You need to know where you are. 
it's not just about what you deal about, but you need to know where you are. And this is one of the very crucial information that should be uh, taken into account when you are studying certain assemb aquatic assemblages. Okay, then we come to the point, how can we split between the effects of natural or anthropogenic factors? This is the case of the Alpine lakes in Slovenia. And we set three parameters between natural parameter, which is a lake, and anthropogenic parameter, which is hydromorphological pressures, pressure. We used also the time parameter. So whether it is important when we sample this, uh, which in which year we sampled this community and the result was that we found that actually pressure in this case hydromorphological pressures are key factors but of course almost of the equal importance were natural parameters so like in which lake we actually are so again it is important to know where you are which ecosystem you study that you can correctly interpret your pressure conditions so that you can correctly interpret the impact of anthropogenic pressures on your aquatic ecosystem. Okay, then we go with slightly more groups of pressures. This is the case of the rivers in Slovenia. Typological parameters are so-called natural parameters. These are parameters where we de uh, differentiate between different types based on natural conditions. And then we use three pressure groups, land use based on Greenland cover, eutrophication based on nutrient parameters. And the third group was other parameters, which were more most related to the hydromorphology, oxygen conditions, and also some other parameters were taken into account. And of course, first of all, we want to know what's the possibility of explaining aquatic communities each of this group and we found the natural factors are actually very important but of course when we uh, assume all efforts of other three stressor groups we found that this assume is slightly bigger than just the topological factor but anyway it's very much evident that we need to take into account natural conditions when we are studying the pressure effect Okay, how we did that? First of all, we just want to find out whether there are any joint effects between natural and anthropogenic factors. Why? Because these joint effects are actually, are not enabling us to understand how and who is impacting the community. And if you just look on the A, these joint effects depend on the pressure that were studied, like the highest was on the land use, was somehow expected because we know that land use depends a lot on natural conditions. We know that we have plenty of intensive agriculture in the Pannonian lowland, but much less in the Alpine ecoregion. Whereas some other pressures like eutrophication is almost independent of the region that we are. It means that eutrophication that is a big consequence of also of water pollution due to the human activities like households, cities, also agriculture is much more independent and it's present in different regions. So the fact is that you need to know what's the relationship between the natural factors and the anthropogenic stress so that you can correctly interpret the results. Of course, at the end, we want to know what are the effects of these individual stressor groups and the combination of different stressor groups. And again, when we have several joint effects, it's not easy to explain or at least to define what's the key pressure gradient. And we were lucky because in this case, we found that this individual FS were much bigger, like 70% of the explained variability of the sandwiches was based on the individual effects, whereas this combined or joint effects were much lower. On the other hand, land use was 
the most influential factor, whereas other like cardiomorphology was the second, and eutrophication was the factor with the lowest explainable variability. It means that land use is definitely one of the crucial effects, and especially land use in the whole catchment that needs to be considered for the conditions of the aquatic ecosystems. Then we go to the aquatic habitat, especially the hydromorphological conditions. We were interested again, natural conditions defined by typology group, habitat quality on one hand, and habitat modification on the other hand. So whether there is a good relationship with typological conditions and habitat quality and typological conditions and habitat modification. And we found that actually there are again high individual factors that are explaining community and quite low joint effects, although Topology and habitat quality are, some, are somehow related, but this percentage is much lower than individual effects. On the other hand, again, habitat quality values are much more important, better explaining community than habitat modification. Very simple to say. It's not what you do. It's not what you do by the barrier or what you do by the channelization of the river, but much more important is what habitat is actually established when you after your modification was done so it means it's much more important the actual habitat that not action that was done so the conditions upstream of the barrier can vary a lot because it depends also on the conditions of the habitat that you can find with these this impoundment like we were discussing this before it's not just about the barrier, but also about the conditions that you can find within the ecosystem. And the last case study was related to the recent study of the large rivers in the Southeast Europe. The main idea behind that was that we want to get much more uh, semi-natural sites. As we know that uh, Sava downstream of uh, Slovenia uh, don't have barriers. There is Una River with uh, almost completely natural habitat. Uh, we also included uh, Drava and Mura and uh, Kolpa River so that we increase the number of the sampling sites and address three main stressor groups like water quality, land use, and hydromorphology. As we know that usually when you look to the different reports, they say, okay, hydromorphology is the main pressure that we can find in our large rivers because we built a dam, we built, we take the water away and so on and so on. And actually what we have found out, yes, on one hand, of course, hydromorphology is dominant pressure in large rivers, but water quality is still a very important issue that can be found in large rivers in Southeast Europe. So it's not just about the hydromorphology that we talk a lot, but it's also about the water quality. Although if you look also to the politicians, they will often say, okay, we solve the issues. We have, uh, we have wastewater treatment plants. We build uh, the systems uh, that drain, drain the water and so on and so on. But still plenty of pollutants is still draining into the surface waters and also impacting the aquatic communities. What was also interesting that the joint effects between the land use and hydromorphology or land use and water quality was actually minimal. So land use have another effect on the aquatic community that is not covered by hydromorphology and is not covered by water quality. And what's meant by that? As already mentioned before, urbanization is one of the main factors affecting uh, surface waters, and this can be high, quite a huge effect even with low percentages. And it means changes in the water flow, changes in the uh, habitat conditions, changes in the water quality due to pollution, due to pollution spilling of the surface areas and so on and so on. So actually land use can have different effects in comparison to the water quality and hydromorphology. So from the management perspective, it's very much 
crucial to take into account all these different pressures. And what's even more important of the final result is that that most of these effects were independent of the typological factors. These joint effects were actually very small. What's much better for explaining the actual conditions and taking action, what's important in the management is taking action. Okay, and no challenges. We need to have a holistic approach of the pressure impact relationships. We need to study joint effects of natural and anthropogenic factors. And of course, we need to understand joint effects of pressures. And of course, we need to disentangle the effects of different pressures if we want to assess and manage river systems and lake systems appropriately. Okay, now we will look to the ecological assessment of fresh waters. Again, it's based on the Water Framework Directive. Slightly, we already discussed this before. So surface waters are generally split in two groups. On one hand, rivers, lakes, transitional and coastal waters. And on the other hand, artificial and heavily modified water bodies and impoundments are in this second group. And based on this, we usually then assess ecological status for natural systems and for modified and artificial we assess ecological potential because we need to define another conditions. Today, we will talk about the ecological status and about the natural systems that were studied uh, in these case studies that I will present. Okay, let's at first look the difference between the past assessment and the assessment according to the Water Framework Directive. In the past, we were dealing mostly with the water quality. Okay whether it is polluted or not, very simple. Whereas today we talk about the quality of the aquatic ecosystem, like riparian zone, habitat, diversity condition, water quality, and also water quantity. So we would try to use the ecosystem approach. We try to use all the ecosystem conditions that are present there and not only the water phase. In the past, we actually used the saprobic system for assessment of the conditions and it was based only on the oxygen conditions, like saprobity and was heavily uh, related to the water quality issue. But nowadays we use the ecological status assessment systems. We use different biological elements. We use different, we assess pressure of, uh, impact of different pressures. And of course we can use uh, different, biological quality elements for different pressures, but also some biological quality elements also assess same pressures. But what's, why we use actually different biota for same pressures? The main issue is that the response of different communities differ. Like some group of organisms like phytobentos react very suddenly to the conditions to the changes in the conditions where some other communities need much more time and same is also with the response of these communities to improvements some react very fast where some others are much slower in their response and we will look at that later okay another important point in the ecological status assessment is reference condition approach. So we need to define what's in the reference, what the natural condition. And of course, moreover, we need to define type specific reference conditions. So it means each type, if type of the wa surface water have different reference conditions and we need to define them. And this is definitely very demanding, especially due to the fact that reference means no human impact. And we know that especially in the Europe, there are not many such areas. So several other approaches need to be used, like historical data, modeling, and even expert judgment, if there are no other options. Another important thing related to the ecological assessment is that we use bioindication approach. So we were discussing slightly the issue of sampling uh, pollution parameters. So we go there and sample like four times here, 10 times here, 12 times here, whatever. 
but there are many many data that we don't have information about you know because when we don't sample we don't know what has happened there but what's the main advantage of the biota because biota was present there all the time especially assemblages were present there all the time and when we go to sample it okay the results of all the past activities that were so something might happen during the night something might happen two months ago okay the biota is results of these activities if we would go and measure it like with uh, different equipment we would find out okay that it's not so easy to detect it and if you maybe even average it in the final calculation we won't observe any impact so chemical physical chemical parameters and hydrological parameters are using as supporting elements in the ecological assessment the key issue of the bioindicators is that we need to have differences in the species response this is the case from the macrophyte that we studied in Slovenia and found that we can observe differences in the species respond to the environmental gradient, to the pressure gradient in this case. We have some species that are very sensitive, we have some species that are very tolerant, like sea species, but of course we also have species that are somewhere in between, but also some that are very ubiquitous. It means they are present and don't depend the level of the pressure but of course, these are not good indicators. In this case, our ABC taxa. So they are present all over the environmental gradient and we cannot use them for the bioassessment. But the key characteristic of the biota need to be species responses need to vary to the same pressure. And this is key characteristics needed for bioassessment. Then we go to the how this relationship observed between the pressure gradient, in this case, is again hydromorphological iterations. We come back to these five hydromorphological indices that we developed in Slovenia. And the distribution of benthic invertebrate taxa along this pressure gradient. And we can see that taxa are actually distributed. They are not all species at the same place, and these triangles are indicating one triangle, one species. It means that there is a distribution of taxa. And what's even more important that we have need to have sites from natural to heavily altered sites. And based on this information along the X axis, we can see how, they, how species are distributed along this pressure gradient because along the X axis gradient is actually the hydrophological pressure gradient. And we use this information but we used also other characteristics of each species. And first characteristic, characteristic is optimum of the species. And the second characteristic is ecological valency. So width of the curve. So when we have so stenic species, so they are present only at a certain amount of the pressure, like only in natural conditions, only in heavily modified conditions. We have the value five when we have this species with very wide curves. It means that species can be present in natural as well as in heavily degraded conditions, then the value is one. Another information is the optimum of the species that is marked with different colors. And we and the condition where actually the abundances of the species should be highest. And these two characteristics, width of the curve, and the optimum of the species top of the curve are used later for calculation of the conditions based on the aquatic communities. So let's look at one of such samples. Actually, there is a equation where we use so-called weighted average approach. So this RF value is so-called indication of hydromorphological alteration and is based on the optimum of the species. And then we have two weights. The first weight is abundance class. So we didn't use the abundance like number of specimens because we need to know that in the benthic vertebrates, there might be several species that have several specimens because they are very small, but we can have some species that have huge 
specimens like uh, Hirudina salicis uh, can be like 10 centimeters long, where some uh, hieronymids can be only a couple of millimeters long. So we decided to use abundance classes. And to the other hand, another factor, weighting factor was actually specialization or so-called width of the curve that is present for the indicators. And of course, these indicators that are good should have higher values and very narrow curves. So they have higher value, five, whereas those that have very wide curves have much lower value, one. And it means that they add much less to the final index calculation. And then we tested the index response to the pressure gradient. We use this hydromorphological quality and observe very good relationship. R square is 0.7, what is very good actually, uh, because for certain systems we can observe much, much lower relationships. Of course, nowadays it's very useful to have several metrics in the index, not just one metric, because if you use more metrics, then you have more robust index. And we decided to test several others characteristics of the assemblages in three from three different groups. First were so-called functioning characteristics, second were composition characteristics, and the third group were diversity characteristics. And this is the case study from the large rivers. And we actually observed that the biodiversity metrics are not good indicators of the hydromorphological alterations uh, in large rivers. And of course, it was very, on one hand, surprising. And we just want to understand what is actually happening in the assemblage along the hydromorphological gradient. And we found out that actually you can have similar number of taxa in natural as well as in impacted sites, even at heavily altered sites. And what's the reason? That when the pressure gradient start to increase, usually at the beginning, spe specific taxa are not able to withstand the conditions and are actually disappear from the community. But in the second phase, new taxa are arriving. So similar is what was already explained before, when you add uh, appropriate amount of the like nutrients in the system, then usually the number of taxa should increase. But of course, only to the certain level. With hydromorphology, it's slightly different because at first you lose some taxa and then new taxa will arrive because the conditions will change completely. And usually in the impoundments, you can find completely different taxa in comparison to the river systems. Another very important thing that should be considered is that you need to have two independent data sets. When you develop the index, you need so-called calibration data set, whereas later you need so-called validation data set. So it means you need to check whether the observed relationship is really such as you observe based on your development data set. Why? Because it could be by chance that you actually observe very good relationship. But of course, in this case, it was very much evident that even when we used validation data set that was independent, from the previous one, the relationship is still very high and kind of confirmation that your assessment system is appropriate to define hydromorphological alterations, impacts in your river system. And now we come to the key question, what's good? So we have five classes, high status, good status, moderate status, poor status, and bad status. And the key question is what's good? Why? Because the main objective of uh, the management is to achieve good status. And of course, when you have a scale between zero and one, then it's not so easy to provide the answer. So what is good? Of course, there are different opinions about that, different views that need to be harmonized somehow. And, and again, depends what you would like to do with your, how you would like to manage your aquatic ecosystems. Okay, now just look some of the possibilities to define this boundary, good moderate. So we need to define 
based on the biota, based on the biota, and to define, but very often is used so called equidistant deviation approach. So, equidistant deviation approach means that you are not sure what where you should put the boundary and just divide your pressure gradient in equidistant classes, like in this case, and all the the difference between the good and moderate, moderate and poor, poor and bad and bad and the lowest boundary is equal. But you are not sure whether it is really good what you mentioned to be good. So we actually developed another approach. We were interested whether it is possible to do it based on the changes in the aquatic communities. We looked to the so-called sensitive taxa and the tolerant taxa and observe their portion during the pressure gradient. And we found that actually with increasing the pressure gradient and lowering the index values, the percentage of sensitive taxa is decreasing, whereas percentage of tolerant taxa is increasing. And based on these differences, the boundaries were set. And of course, these boundaries are not equidistant as were in the previous case, but depends on the conditions in the community. Although, we use such approach. The main question is whether we see the things same way. So it can be like a case between the biology and biomimic, biomimicry or bionics that I actually lecture, lecture. Because if you look to the elephant, okay, from the biological point of view, we will teach what's elephant and everything what can be used. In the biomimicry or bionics, we actually study how different natural system can be used in technique. Like, okay, and when you look to the elephant, you can have, you can have several ideas. Okay, it can be a pillar, it can be a, a concrete, it can be a whatever. So this is also the case whether all biologists see good state of same way. And that's the reason that there was an intercalibration approach at the European level to compare develop assessment systems and to compare the boundaries. There were several groups, Alpine, Mediterranean, Eastern Continental, large river were separate groups and so on. And on the right hand side, you can see the results of the comparison in the Mediterranean region. Actually, we deal with that for 10 years. And actually, at the end, we observed that there was no common view what's good, even among biologists. So, like Spain say that the boundary should be lower, whereas France and Italy say the boundary should be higher in comparison to the average value, whereas Slovenia, we were in the somewhere in the middle. And of course, it was necessary to harmonize because from the European scale, it is important that same criteria are applied all over the Europe, especially that we can say that we have comparable co conditions when we say something is good and something is not good. And that was the reason that this intercalation process was conducted. Okay, let's go at the end also to the DNA-based methods. Here we studied uh, possibility to use DNA-based methods for the ecological assessment and compare the conditions uh, to the existing assessment systems. Because what I showed before, these are existing assessment systems used in Slovenia. And we immediately observed that there are different groups of states and uh, countries mark green. It might be very easy to use this in DNA based approach, whereas countries in red, among them is also Slovenia, have quite uh, a demanding assessment system, type specific assessment system, pressure specific assessment systems. And that's the reason that it's not so easy to switch to the DNA based, based methods. Although I'm sure that in the future, DNA based methods will be used. But at the moment, uh, I think we still need some more research uh, done on that. Okay, challenges. So, how to define type specific reference conditions, how to set bioindicator based boundaries, 
and how to develop ecological assessment approach and which ecological assessment approach should be actually used. 